Okay. Welcome, everybody. I'm Andy Miller from the Department of Geography and Environmental Systems here at the NBC. It's my pleasure uh, today to introduce for our seminar our own Dr. Yolanda Valencia. Yolanda is a feminist, a writer, and teacher. In 2019, Dr. Valencia completed her PhD in geography at the University of Washington in Seattle. And that same year, she joined UMBC as an assistant professor here at the Department of Geography and Environmental Systems. Drawing on transnational approaches, her work focuses on understanding how undocumented immigrants make meaningful life in the midst of state sponsored violence in the United States. Dr. Valencia is currently working on a collaborative book titled Interrupting Impoverishment. Unlearning Poverty, Demonstrating Poverty Knowledge. He teaches classes on qualitative methods, Latin America, and geographies of migration. And we're very happy to have her. Uh, Thank you, the floor is yours. Take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andy, for such an introduction. And also, thank you for organizing these seminars and for inviting me to uh, share part of my work with all of you today. Thank you everyone for coming. I'm so excited to see how many people are joining today. I appreciate that you are taking the time for that. Um, I also want to say that I am an uninvited guest in the unceded lands of the Susescano peoples and here in Maryland. So um, may, probably by now you might have figured out that based on the title and uh, this presentation, we all have content of colonization, wars and violence. All right, let's see. Okay, late on March of 2020, the World Health, Health Organization Director General announced, quote, we are at war with a virus that threatened to tear us apart, end quote. Just four days before, during a news presidential conference on the, on the coronavirus, Donald Trump referred to himself as, quote, a wartime president, end quote. As Brielle Duskin indicates, declaring a war on things rather than on countries is not new. In 1964, President Lyndon Johnson declared the war on poverty. Seven years later, Richard Nixon introduced the war on drugs. During his administration, President Clinton officially initiated a war on crime when he declared the violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act in 1994. And President George Bush declared the war on terror soon after the 9-11 attacks in 2001. All of these contemporaneous wars facilitate strategic military, military interventions on targeted places and people, but they also enable an ongoing persecution of black, brown, and indigenous people at the scale of their body both in the so-called Global South, but also in the Global North. Amos threat, their persecution is justified as a way to protect the life of a selected group of privileged citizens. And this is one way in which the global, that is global policies, interventions, and war, hurts the intimate. Indeed, these wars hurt targeted racialized people at the scale of their body families and communities. As such, my talk today is inspired by a concept or a process called necropolitics. This concept was produced by post-colonial theorist Akil's Membe as a contribution to Foucault's concept of biopolitics. Foucault describes biopolitics as a new sovereign power over life, as a power to protect some and let others die. In other words, he described biopolitics as the work of life or as a relationship between politics and life. Racism, according to Foucault, is the determining factor of who gets to live and who and who are worth of protection and those whose lives can be killed or let die. Necropolitics is described by Bembe as the work of death, as the relationship between politics and death and hence through wars. The work of death has enabled colonization through genocide, slavery, and stealing of lands. It has also enabled the production and reaffirmation of contemporary states in the entire hemisphere. 
Ruth Wilson Gilmer described this as organized violence, which leads into unequal distribution of life chances, pushing some into premature death. What I will add and reveal in this presentation is some of the ways in which the state produces conditions of death and then exposes racialized people into such harmful conditions, oftentimes through the declaration of war against the same conditions produced by colonial and empire state, such as poverty, terror, drugs, illegality, crime, and diseases. This way, the work of death enables the ongoing unequal distribution of life chances. While all these wars have negatively impacted most people from the so-called Global South, both in the Global South, but also in the Global North, I will focus on two wars, the war on COVID and the war on drugs, to show how such wars negatively affect indigenous descent communities at their intimate level. More specifically, I will focus on a rural campesino community that extends across the Global South and Global North. While these two events might seem very different from one another, I want to take this opportunity to think with you on how such events have forced the same community into premature death, as well as to how these wars have deeply impacted a relational and meaningful way of life, but nevertheless, a way of life that prevails and is so much needed in the midst of so much risk, insecurity, and violence. Also, I would like to think about the role of an ongoing global colonial and imperial racial hierarchy that determines who gets to live and who gets to die. Last summer, I visited my Mexican community in Pasco, Washington, where it is estimated that over 60% of its 76,000 residents are Latinx or Hispanic, and that is on the images on the uh, left-hand side. The majority of my extensive community, oops, sorry. Okay, the majority of my extensive Mexican community there migrated from the same rural community in Mexico to which I will refer to as El Rancho, and that is the two images on the right. Okay, what is going on? El Rancho is located in Purepecha territory within the Abya Yala continent, also known by its colonial name as the American continent. More specifically, El Rancho is located in a place currently known as Michoacan, Mexico. There, I lived through age of 17 before migrating to the US. In Michoacan, as in other regions along the Abya Yala, Guns and disease enable indigenous genocide and land dispossession by white Europeans through wars and through their own loss of private property. Enslavement of both indigenous and African people facilitated labor and life extraction. After independence in the 1800s, structures of power stayed the same and white European descent continued to occupy the oligarchy. Currently, national and transnational wars and law have, have been used to continue extraction, land dispossession, and genocide, all in the name of free capital, development, and modernity. But as Catherine McKittrick indicates, where there is oppression, there is resistance. During the winter break, I was also able to visit a rancho where our elders and some community members continue to reside. In both places, Pasco and El Rancho, I was curious to see how the coronavirus was, was impacting their lives because it has become such a big deal in our lives here. I was surprised to find that not only the virus has been detrimental, but also the ongoing war on drugs. How this phenomena impacts the community does differ across the space and context, but nevertheless, they both have been manipulated by those in power in the US, white supremacy, and in Mexico, the oligarchy, who are also white supremacists. Through the war on drugs and COVID, indigenous and indigenous descent communities have been highly exposed to death. Also, these two wars have negatively impacted one way or another rural community relational way of life. It is this way of life which I presented two years ago as being so significant in producing meaningful and humane conditions under state-sponsored violence in Mexico and also in the US. 
Next, I will bring these two events in conversation within their own context, contradictions, and intersections. For the past 13 months or so, the COVID-19 has touched all of our lives one way or another. Soon after its emergence, a war was declared on such virus. Some of us in the US have been privileged enough to have access to free testing, stimulus checks, vaccinations, and work from home to avoid further exposure. Indeed, our lives have been protected. However, that is not the case for many, including for racialized, minoritized groups whose presence in what we call the US has been made illegal by the law, and yet their work has been declared essential. This way, they have been forced to be among the frontline fighters of the war on COVID. According to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, racial and ethnic minority groups are, out, are overrepresented in the essential work of care and in the food industry. As feminist scholars have pointed out, provisions of care and food are an ongoing need for or mere survival. However, the labor that goes into such services is often invisibilized, gender, the value, racialized, and yet essential including the labor of farm workers, many of whom are indigenous and indigenous descent displaced people from the so-called global south. This is the case of many in my Mexican community in Pasco whose lives are not deemed worth of protection. As Miriam Jordan from the New York Times indicates, immigrant farm workers who are mostly undocumented were told to keep working despite a stay at home order issued in April of last year. Such a stay order then only apply to those who, whose lives is to be protected by the state, while they, racialized and illegalized people, were ordered to keep working, to risk their lives, so that the we, the selected privileged we, could be fed and out of exposure. In fact, immigrant farm workers were mandated to keep working even in the midst of additional health risks due to harmful air quality conditions during the wildfires of the West Coast last September. In response, some, including Professor Bobadilla, describe immigrant farm workers as heroes who should be recognized for their essential work in our society. While this is true, it is important to point out that farm workers had no choice but to work to be the frontline fighters of COVID-19 by providing food for our tables and this way to be heroes. Their employers often force harsh policies that penalize them for missing a few days of work, justified or not. On top of this, employers were not taking any sanitation measures and they kept people working in large crowds, alleging that because their jobs were outdoors, and the weather was getting warmer, there was no risk of contracting the virus. However, farm workers knew. They knew they faced higher risk of contracting the virus, but also they faced other risks. On the one hand, lack of documentation means that while all kinds of taxes are deducted from their paychecks and every purchase they make, they are legally discriminated again against any protection, including obtaining social safety net benefits, such as unemployment, retirement benefits, and most recently, the COVID-19 relief checks. As such, those made undocumented by the state through the immigration law have been pushed into conditions of death, including greater exposure to the virus. In this case, their dilemma has been either to go to work and face the possibility the possibility of getting the virus and spreading it into their families and communities, or to not go to work and face the immediate, the immediate risk of getting fired and not being able to feed their families, pay rent and other living expenses. As a result, basically everyone continued working. Many contracted the virus, spread it to their families, and some lost their lives. According to the CDC, while Hispanic or Latinos are 18% of the US population, they represent almost 30% of COVID cases. And their number of deaths is 2.3 times higher as compared to whites. 
in the case of the immigrant community in Pasco, extensive family work networks often support each other in reciprocity by delivering food, flowers, and remedies to sick families. This was meaningful, but they also faced isolation, as most of us did and continue to do. What is ironic is that, on the one hand, this community has been forced to greater exposure to the disease and death. And at the same time, as I mentioned in my previous presentation two years ago, visiting the sick in hospitals and accompanying each other in funerals is essential for the making of meaningful and humane life for those whose personhood and humanity has been denied by the state. But nevertheless, this practice had to be sacrificed. It had to stop when it was and it is most needed. It was and is most needed precisely because these people had been forced to greater exposure to death. So that the privileged we, the selected we, those who the state protects via white supremacy laws, get to live. In recognition of their essential role in our society, during his campaign, President Biden promised zero deportation during his first 100 days in office. And yet, in following Biden's January 20th executive order, the immigration and control enforcement agents were directed to, quote, continue expedite removal of those who presented national and border security threats. A non-citizen is presumed, is presumed to be a national security threat if he or she has engaged in or is suspected if he's suspected of engaging in terrorism, espionage activities, or if his or her apprehension is necessary to protect the nation. A non-citizen is presumed to be a border security threat or he, if he or she is apprehended at the border on or after November 1st, 2020, or was not physically present in the U.S. on such date. As a result, as of March 15, only 55 days after President Biden took office, he, this administration has deported 127,457 people. What does it mean to be framed as both essential, but at the same time as possible threat to this nation and to its borders? What does this enable? How is it possible that someone can be deported just because there is a presumption, a suspicion, that a non-citizen is a threat? And what specifically makes any non-citizen who enter into the US without documents on or after November 1st of 2020 a threat to the US national border? This determination is often made discretionally by those in power, by those who make the laws by and for the protection of white supremacy by those who have been consciously and unconsciously trained to distinguish whose lives must be protected and whose lives can be banished for the good of the privileged ones. As such, this memo effectively enables ICE to deport any, non any minoritized, racialized, illegalized people and thus enhances the deportability threat for brown and indigenous Latinx immigrant communities. As Lisa Marie Cacho indicates, for people made illegal by the law, it is their presence, not their actions, that makes them criminals. In other words, they have been made de facto criminals just by being here. As such, being made an essential worker, illegal by the law, and framed as a possible threat, both produces the conditions of premature death and forces people into such conditions. In addition to the war on COVID, for which the immigration law enabled forcing some into higher exposure, the war on drugs and crime enables further criminalization and persecution at the scale of their bodies. Indeed, as we might be winning the war on COVID, the other wars are on full blossom. On February of this year, the New York Police Department deployed a robot dog to fight crime on the streets of neighborhoods with high numbers of Black and Latino populations. Those are the neighborhoods and the streets of Brooklyn, Queens, and most recently, the Bronx. This way, the ongoing use of necropolitics, that is, politics of death, 
through the ongoing war on drugs and crime, continues to be used to protect white supremacy power. Such necropolitics in the form of contemporary wars expands across national borders into the global south, where the US uses military power to control land, resources, and people. Understanding such a scale of violence helps in uh, responding a mainstream question that goes as follows, more or less. If it is that bad in the US, why is it that these immigrants do not return to their country? Well, the problem is that the US not only makes it hard for black, indigenous, and people of color in this part of the continent, but also the US produces detrimental conditions in alliance with the white oligarchy in power across the Abya Yala continent. As I have argued in my 2017 Gender, Place, and Culture article, migration studies need to consider the migration journey, that is origins, borders, and destination, because immigrant communities expand across such places, and their lives and experiences tend to be organized and understood in relation to such complex spaces. For instance, in the case of my immigrant community in Pasco, their communities expand the national colonizing and deadly US-Mexico border, and as such, the same community is being affected in these three sites. Knowing that the community in El Rancho continues to be abandoned, let die, and further exposed to death through the war on drugs presents another barrier to be able to return. Often, this prevents the ability to pass to the next generation specific ways of being and knowing that can only be reproduced in the context of El Rancho. What is worse is that at times, the interlocks of community relations in rural communities have been weaponized by cartel members, or in other words, the informal organized crime, who use such relations to hurt the community in profound ways. At this, at, and the state turns a blind eye on this issue, or often works alongside the cartels. To clarify, there is a hierarchy of race and class that was established in formal colonial times when the white Spanish and their descendants were put in positions of power, ownership, and placed themselves at the top of the pyramid as the norm. Indeed, independence did not undo such structures, and the oligarchy who upholds and protects a form of white supremacy power continue to exist. Currently, there are members of the oligarchy in positions of power in both the formal organized crime, that is the state, but also the informal organized crime, the cartels. Although Mexico adapted a national mestizo identity that supposedly made us all one race, in reality, that is not the case. This identity serves as a whitening project that attempts to diminish the history of conquest and ongoing settler colonialism. It also serves to erase the presence of black and the Indianized and thus modernized people. Being indigenous or indigenous descent campesino is framed as backward. As such, rural communities tend to be abandoned, unprotected, and persecuted. Similar to how black communities were hurt the most during the industrialization of US cities, and in turn, they were criminalized a surplus labor through the war on drugs initiated by the Nixon administration, rural communities in Mexico had been hit the worst by neoliberal policies, and they too had been criminalized, heavily militarized through the war on drugs. At the same time, the US also militarizes its national borders, turning them into dangerous zones where displaced people from places like El Rancho and other parts of the Abya Yala are exposed to death. According to the United Nations, um, hundreds of people died every year in this border. Just in 2019, close, of four, close to 500 people lost their lives, and this is only what they admit. I want to return to this mural. This is a mural painted on a wall of a refugee home located in Oaxaca, Mexico. I took the photo when I visited the first time during a study abroad program a few years ago. I do not know who is the artist, but this mural conveys some of the complexities that I am trying to explain here. As I move into the next phase or the next part of my talk, 
the one that focuses on places of origin, I want to bring an important question inspired by Tiffany King's recent book, The Black Shoals. In this book, Tiffany King explains how, quote, the endeavor of surviving under conditions of, of conquest is never clean. On the relations of conquest, Black and Indigenous people made difficult and agonizing choices when it came to negotiating and fighting for existence. After all, five civilized tribes made a choice to enslave Black slaves to prove their own humanness. It did not have to be this way. She goes on to say, the conquistador settler established the violent terms and contemporary social relations. End quote. In a sense, under relations of conquest, colonized groups make the difficult choice to oppress each other in order to survive and in order to prove their humanness as private property owners, wealthy, civilized, and thus closer to whiteness. In a similar vein, I share, as I share this next part, I want to understand what does it mean to survive and to exist under colonial and empire relations, where this possession and bordering is exacerbating at the same time as the hegemonic idea of contemporary human described as the he who consumes and he who accumulates wealth through private property and he who is white and rich, as per Sylvia Winters, continues to be overimposed in Abya Yala and probably in the rest of the world. It seems that the need to survive and the ongoing race to prove humanness in a context of disadvantage and lack of opportunity and in a context of US hegemony is forcing people into the difficult choice to oppress each other at different scales. While Mexico does have an oligarchy in power that upholds and protects white supremacy and ideas of humanness, it, also, it is also dominated by the US empire. It is well known that Mexico has become the south border of the U.S. who provides the U.S. who provides aid, training, and military power for that via agreements such as the Plan Frontera Sur established in 2014 under the Obama administration. Similar to Mexico, Honduras and Guatemala are increasingly becoming U.S. borders. On January 18 of this year, just before President Biden took office. The BBC News reported that the Guatemalan state blocked about 7,000 people from coming, that were coming from Honduras. And two days ago, on April 12th, the U.S. was able to make a deal with these three countries who agreed to increase their military power in efforts to stop the thousands of displaced peoples from reaching the U.S. This is one way in which President Biden is fulfilling his promise to address root causes of displacement from Central America, that is from the central part of the Abya Yalan continent. He's making local people make the difficult choice to deny themselves the ability and the right to move. While at the same time, unfair economic policies, climate change, and wars wage on them continue to deny them the right to stay home. This is not a crisis. This is not new. This is a result of 500 years of colonial and imperial relations. As Harsha Wadi and others indicate, colonization is not an event. It is a structural condition. It is a necropolitical condition where the work of death is constantly enacted via multiple wars on things, things that target the mere people who are the most affected by colonial and empire relations. Next, I will focus on how the war on drugs and COVID produces multiple operations, including one at the intimate le level that involves meaningful relations in places like El Rancho. In El Rancho, there is only one small clinic and one part-time nurse, low supplies of basic medicine, and the sporadic presence of a medical doctor. The poorly maintained dirt roads that lead to this community make El Rancho almost inaccessible. It takes about three hours to get to a town or a city. Both in El Rancho and in the two nearby towns, there is no access to COVID testing, much less to vaccinations. 
while there is testing in the city, it costs somewhere between 200 pesos and up to 4,500 pesos, depending on the quality and the speed of the test results. While at the same time, the minimum wage is only 141 pesos. So again, the lowest cost is 200 pesos, and yet the minimum wage is 141 pesos per day. As such, people with the symptoms of a cold or what could be the virus most likely will never be diagnosed. Instead, people exchange remedies for the cold and trust that they do not have the virus. This is worrisome. But what surprised me the most is that far from the virus, what is clearly modifying their way of life is the presence of cartel members in the community. With pressure and support from the US, President Calderon declared the war on drugs in 2006. By that time, drug trafficking from Colombia had been the route from, uh, through Central America and Mexico because the Caribbean route, routes had, uh, had been closed as a result of Plan Colombia, a plan that had been implemented six years before under the Bush administration. So in 2006, Mexico declared a war on a thing that criminalized its own people. And the Merida Initiative was signed that same year. Through this initiative, the US provides military training, support, and equipment so that Mexico can militarize, incarcerate, kill, and control its people. However, as Dan Pali, Melissa Wright, and others indicate, the US is not seeking to end the drug business. Rather, the US seeks to protect its neoliberal global economy by criminalizing those who are the most negatively affected by that. People in El Rancho grow corn and other agrarian products to consume and sell. However, as a result of NAFTA, the Mexican market has been inundated with highly subsidized corn from Canada and the US. As such, it has become cheaper to buy corn than to produce it. In addition, people rely on the rain season for their agriculture, but there has been constant lack of rain, making it harder to grow their own corn and other agrarian products. On the other hand, there is a lack of formal employment. The most common form of employment, which is also scarce, is working as day laborer, and that is usually just for men. In these jobs, people make just above the minimum wage, that is about 200 pesos per day, just enough to afford a kilo of beef, which is 180 pesos. It is this scarcity, and I will add, it is also the need to prove one's humanness that leads ordinary people to become narco-traffickers or cartel members, as per political scientist Martin Meras Garcia. In, in the midst of the war on drugs, cartel members take hard to navigate routes and communities so that, such as El Rancho, in order to make it more difficult for the military to get them. As such, these communities serve as places of encounters between the cartel and the military. As a result, and as Melissa Wright indicates, these communities get criminalized because whenever there is a crime against the people, that crime gets linked into the illicit business. And the rhetoric is that criminals are killing each other. As such, dangerous conditions have, become, have been brought into El Rancho. The community for Rancho does not come with the protection from the state, on the contrary. For instance, even the local police have, been, have become a form of a militarized force. And this image shows how the ordinary police looks in one of the nearby towns. At the same time, this is an example of the or informal organized crime, which we encounter on our way back from, uh, to El Rancho. It is, a hard, it is hard to see, but I was a bit afraid when I took the photo, and that is the best that I could do. Consequently, people in these communities have learned to navigate such daily dangers created by both the US and the Mexican state. However, this has implicated profound harms in the relational way of life. As I mentioned before, El Rancho has a communal way of life because the land, work, and fiestas are by and for the community, as um, Professor uh, Luna has explained how communality works. Despite neoliberal capitalist efforts to weaken the hero system as part of the NAFTA agreement, which enabled privatization of the land, 
the land continues to be held as communal and a hero. Work projects are done in collaboration and fiestas are organized by and for everyone. Also, and most importantly, it is common for people to place each other in relations. And so everyone becomes somehow related to one another and they treat each other as family. But that is not the case. Uh, but that is usually not the case with members of the cartels who have been arriving since the early 2000s. While they left El Rancho for a few years, soon after the rise of the community in the form of auto defensas, some have recently returned. When I visited this winter, I was, it was surprising to find out that more than the coronavirus, it is the presence of the cartel members that is forcing people to modify their way of life. While extortion on businesses from the part of the cartel is well known, the cartels often also place a quota of protection in order for traditional celebrations to take place. They charge to protect the people from the violence that the cartel themselves were automatically enact. As a result, this winter, elders in the community opted for small, intimate Christmas celebrations as opposed to traditional bigger celebrations with posada and a live music in the streets. And this was not due to COVID-19, but rather in order to avoid the harm and the extortion from the organized crime. Members of the cartel, many of whom are ordinary people from near and far places, understand the relational nature of these communities. They try to gain it, but also they weaponize it. In December, for Christmas, they went house to house giving genderized toys for kids. They gave a plastic Barbie doll for girls and a plastic black truck for boys. They also included a ball that say Jalisco on it because the current cartel in El Rancho is from the state of Jalisco. It's not letting me switch. What is going on? I'm trying to go to the next slide. Okay. Rhonda, you switched over to the pen. Oh, okay. Let me start. Not able to do this Thank stuff. you so much. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so El Rancho happens to be located in Michoacán, but it is just about five miles away from the division with Jalisco. It is located where, um, where the purple star is, more or less. Hopefully you can see it, um, right? Um, let me see, like in what I call the Tami of Mexico, where Michoacán and Jalisco is, I could have started in there. That is more or less where, where El Rancho is located. So the presence of the Jalisco cartel in El Rancho also means greater risk of encounters between cartels from the state of Michoacán and this other cartel on the basis of territorial control. Again, people are oppressing each other and also those in between in order to survive and also to gain economic status and those to prove to be human. When I ask some of the mothers why they accepted such gifts, they say they had no choice but to politely accept the gifts even if they didn't want to. It seems that one of their intentions from the cartels is to gain the trust of the children, children that they are starting to recruit because in El Rancho, the majority of people are either older than 55 or younger than 15. And the reason is that almost an entire regeneration of teens and young adults left to the US in the early 2000s and have not been able to return due to the ongoing worsening of economic and violent conditions in El Rancho. When my daughters were playing with a group of kids in the streets in El Rancho, the oldest boy, who is barely 14 years old, ran in here when he saw the cartel members approaching in their luxury trucks. He then told the girls that he hides because he is being recruited, but he doesn't want to work for them. This is indeed scary and the community is actively trying to avoid the pressure to work with the cartels because relations have been previously weaponized. At some point years ago, the previous cartel convinced and forced a few community members to work for them. Some were obligated to work for them in exchange of safety for their family and community, and those who refused were forced to leave or were killed, and their families were threatened and forced out of the community. The few who got convinced was doing large part out of the necessity, 
but also due to the pressure to prove their humanity in the midst of lack of opportunities. Either way, those who join put the entire family and community in danger because if the person who joins makes a mistake, their life can be taken and their families get threatened and forced to leave. The practice of revenge works because cartel members understand the great significance of extensive relations. So while communal and relational way of life to humanize and create meaningful life in the midst of state-sponsored violence is, of, is so important, such connections can also place people in danger because they have been used to harm each other. This is how the global war on drugs, also named by critical scholars as the war on the poor, is profoundly affecting certain communities at the intimate level. This is one reason why many places like El Rancho were and are getting more and more empty as people are forced out. But at the same time, the same people are denied the right to move as they face the increasing military border sponsored by the U.S. Crossing the militarized border has become both more deadly and more expensive. As Harsha Wali explained, migrating was not and is not supposed to be dangerous. We have made it that way. Those who survive the border are made illegal by the immigration law and this way they become exploitative labor who must risk their lives under precarious conditions so that the we, the selected we, can be protected. This same community in the U.S. understand how the conditions are in places of origins like El Rancho. For some, this represents yet another barrier to return. At times, even those who have documents, if they can be placed in relation with the, with what the one person the cartel is targeting, even if that relation is not close at all, they will not be able to visit or return to the community. It will be too risky. This is why it was until December that my daughters were able to visit my parents and extensive community in Rancho for the very first time. Although my dream was, as it is the aspiration of many in my community, for my daughters to visit every year. We were not able to visit due to their dad's last name, which was for a long time linked to a distant relative who was forced to be part of the cartels. Ours is one of many other cases. Although a relational way of life has enabled the making of a humane and meaningful life, it has also been used to harm us, to hurt ourselves in the context of colonial and imperial power relations, in the context of multiple wars waged against people whose ancestors faced genocide and slavery, and people who continue to experience displacement from their lands and are forced into labor exploitation in the U.S all to protect and upheld a consumerist private property humanity set by and for white supremacy. Therefore, I joined the call for abolition, the call to change one thing, according to Ruth Wilson, she says, quote, the call to change one thing, and that one thing is everything. By the way, uh, Ruth Wilson Gilmore will be giving a talk sponsored by UNBC on April 29th, and I hope you can make it. This is just a side commercial. Overall, I am happy to report that my daughters were able to experience for three weeks a communal relational way of life as it is lived in the context of El Rancho, even if it's slightly modified in the midst of it all. Indeed, a version of communal and relational way of life is what enables the making of meaningful life for those who are denied of personhood and humanity across the space and colonizing borders. As such, I will conclude by reading the last part, only the last part of a poem that Aris Beth, my youngest daughter, wrote upon a return from El Rancho a few months ago. She titled her poem, The Fire That Will Never Die. Again, this is only the last part. I also got to go to this little village, the one, that, the one that was once forbidden. And I met the community that had been hidden, another world unlike what I had known, with people who cared for me and received me with open arms. And I met family I had never known. I learned customs unlike my own, a different life filled with a sense of calm, a slower rhythm, filled with the stories that always keep me laughing. 
There is just this sense of carefulness. Everyone knows everyone. Everyone greets each other in the streets. And I met my cousins that I didn't know I had. We played in the streets every day. I felt free. I felt safe. I felt at home. And that fills me with a warm inside me, like a fire that will never die. Thank you. Yolanda, that was just, uh, I don't know what to say. It's, it's both heartbreaking and, and um, well, I, I guess all I'm going to do is ask people to, to post questions because I, 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 I can barely express myself right now. So, um, thank you uh, for bringing that to us. Um, I want to ask people if they have questions. Uh, Post something in the chat and then we'll call on you to unmute and ask Yolanda your question. She's going to have to go right at one because she has an important appointment to meet. But until then, um, you have an opportunity to ask questions. So please do. I'll have my eye on the chat and uh, try to address your questions. And I'm going to try to start sharing. Uh, stop sharing. Okay. So that I people <laughs> thank you again for coming i'm sorry i hope that this was not too depressing but really this is in my heart this is in my mind it is very complex it's hard to explain in only like 45 minutes or so um thank you thank you for being here okay questions please okay uh, first question is from Skylar. Skylar, you want to go ahead and unmute and ask the question? Professor, thank you so much. Um, I, I can see that that was um, very important and very difficult for you to do. I heard you mention um, a name for the continent of America, and I couldn't quite make out what it was. Mm -hmm. It is Abya Jala, and I just wrote it in the chat. Thank you so much. Thank you for asking. Others, please. I think a lot of people are just trying to absorb. <laughs> it's it's uh, quite a story. Um, and your daughter is a wonderful poet. I'm very impressed by that. How old is she? She's 15. She actually turned 15 there. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, it, it was a very touchy poem and I was glad that they were able to go, but I keep thinking about all these other kids who are not able to go and to have that way of life too. I know that some people have been sending children uh, through other, you know, some people in the community who have documents have brought children to El Rancho, but that's not the case for everyone. Okay, so um, Alan has a question, and then uh, we have a couple more lined up. Uh, Yolanda, thank you so much for that beautiful talk, um, and uh, and also for yeah for sharing so many parts of you as well, um, and and especially your um, your daughter's poem was absolutely beautiful. Um, and I also really appreciate your, your comparison between how the war on drugs has affected um, black and brown people across the continent. And I was really seeing those parallels that you were showing. And in particular, I was thinking like, you, you did a great job of breaking down like the purpose you know, for um, keeping labor exploitation and having that cheap labor by having our bodies being a threat and um, and criminalizing our bodies in different ways. Um, and so, but I was I was wondering about how um, the U.S. policies of the war on drugs is uh, exasperating. Um, those issues, and so I was, I was seeing that like, um, I'm seeing some of the same same things of like, 
family fragmentation in, in U.S. Black communities happens directly to prison. Mm -hmm. And people finding alternative economies and having that criminalized. Um, you were describing education being a part of that fragmentation. Um, and so I was just wondering how, like, the war on drugs exasperates that, that fragmentation and, and leaves people more vulnerable. Um, mm -hmm. That's a very good question. And what I can see as you were talking, I was thinking about, um, I know some scholars have compared um, the border wall with prison walls. And to an extent, it is as if the border is serving to separate people um, and to control them that way, to trap some people in this side of the US and become like cheap labor. But also a lot of these people are inside the jails too physically, right? Because detention centers are like prisons and also actually in real prisons too. So um, I can see, and, and again, some people have already made the comparison be between these border walls as being like a jail, like a form of prison with the actual prison system that is actually working to um, to to put some people in place, like because of the like supposedly the surplus labor, right? That that are being like now controlled, and at the same time, people within prisons are also being forced to work for like one dollar per day, or, or you know, like had been their labor is also being extracted at the same time. So definitely, they both work different, but in a, to the end, they sort of to an extent help into the same final goal. Okay, thanks. Uh, Jamie, I think you're up next. Hi, Yolanda. Oh my gosh, thank you. Thank you, that was amazing. Um, as like a food geographer, I have heard many of those just by reading up on it and stuff like that, but it's amazing to put like a face and a story to that context. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna choose mm -hmm. not to show my face. It's very emotional right now, but um, but I, I do thank you. And I was wondering, and like um, Chris's question, you kind of brought up this like the attention of people that are working as a labor force culture, but have there been people leaving the country, has that labor force diminished or is it in like a crisis point now because of COVID? I was, I was very curious about this because I'm going to conferences and like our numbers of labor have been diminishing since 2016 for, you know, obvious reasons. Um, so I wanted to like get your take on like how COVID is also affecting that and like how that relates to like going into these places where they might be even more at risk. Mm. Okay, you were cutting a little bit, but I think I got part of your question um, or maybe all of it. So um, I, I know I have seen studies that say that, you know, migrants, especially migrants from Mexico are diminishing. Um, I have a few like, okay, I know and we can understand why borders are becoming more deadly right so and more expensive to cross and more risky to cross so it's basically unaffordable even to try to come uh, but at the same time that means that people who used to practice circular migration and count again as coming again because i know a lot of people from my community used to migrate in the 80s and 90s and they used to practice circular migration I can see how they going back and then coming back were counting again as, as if they were just coming in. So I wonder about once about the counting and second for sure, this making of a more risky space that we call the US-Mexico border definitely is contributing to less people being able to make it into this side. And people who try to get asylum um, uh, granted, I mean, they have to prove and they have to go through all of this process and many of them are, are denied and we know there is a cap on that as well. And so, um, yes, there is more scarcity of labor, even in the agriculture. Um, I know the people in my community who, who work there tell me that the, the, what they are doing now is they are bringing uh, people under visas, seasonal labor, 
to do to fulfill this this um, sort of scarcity of, of labor and I'm talking about uh, the the agriculture in this case um, so this is how they are able to then manipulate and be able to bring and in source the labor have them work here and then make sure that they go back to their homes right because we only want their labor when we need it and then we want to make sure that we dispose of them um, I don't know about the, the COVID-19 in this case, you know, what is the specific role, but what I understand is that every year they are bringing more and more people. They put them into like uh, these very tight places uh, to, to live and that they were, the the uh, virus was easily spread within within them because they were put into, um, into um, places that were very small and, and quite a few people living in the same space. Later, they modify it because they saw that they, the numbers of, of cases were increasing because of that. Yeah, I don't know. Hopefully that answered the questions more or less. I mean, it gave me a lot to think about and I just thank you for that further response and your entire talk. Thank you, Jamie. Okay, Yolanda, I'm not seeing any other questions. I'm seeing a lot of thanks. Um, and I do want to let people know that this uh, so is recorded and it will be posted on the YouTube channel of the Center for Social Science Scholarship. They do that with all of our seminars. And we will send out an email to let people know what the link is once that is up and available. Um, it is, we have like a little over two minutes left. I don't know that we have time for really another question. Um, Yolanda, you want to have any final words before we, before we break? Because I'm not, I'm seeing just a lot of thanks and congratulations. Thank um, you. Thank you for coming. Thank you everyone. And I just want to remind you, hopefully you guys can make it to the Ruth Wilson Gilmore talk on um, abolition geographies. Um, and hopefully this talk can also be in conversation with, with Ruth Wilson Gilmore as an evidence. Um, thank you, everyone, and um, I'm so happy that you were able to come and be here with me. And if you have any questions later, if you think about them, go ahead and send me an email. I would love to have a conversation, any comment, any anything. Um, I want to be in conversation with all of you. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Yolanda. And I will let everybody know we actually have two. It's going to be talks on two successive days, so we'll send out announcements about those uh, as well. Thanks very much. We're going to end the recording now, so thanks everybody for joining us. Thank you. Have a good one.